All right, hello everyone. We're ready to start now. Um, so another day, another unit. We're going to be starting a new unit today on pesticides, which is great. That means also there's a new unit assignment that opens today. Um, I'm doing some soul searching and realizing that we're coming close to the end of the course now. We've got this week, full week, two, two classes, next week, two classes, and then the following Tuesday is our last class. So that means including today we only have five lectures left. And what this means is that for these unit assignments, um, I'm not going to have any unit assignments where the due date trails past the 13th, which is the last day of class. So that may affect, I don't think it'll be a problem for this one and probably for Thursdays either. But uh, yeah, just realize that maybe every unit that we finish between now and the end of semester, we may not have a unit assignment for all of those, or at least one that is due and will contribute to your, to your grade. That makes sense. Uh, I sent just a very quick email out this morning reminding you of the deadline for the previous unit assignment which is on polymers, that's going to be due this Thursday morning. And also due on Thursday is your assignment twos. So hopefully you have that well in hand and aren't just starting to think about that now. Uh, but the assignment two is the video assignment. And just a reminder, the way you need to submit your assignment to me is to go onto ACORN. There's a link at the very top of the page where you click to submit your assignment and you submit it through a link. And if for some reason you can't send me a link uh, and you want to send me a file, you can either come see me in my office with a thumb drive or another possibility is if you want to share it with me via Dropbox or OneDrive, you can send me a link just through my email and we can do it that way too. So I think we have lots of ways to get the information to me. Uh, so far I haven't come across any issues that people have had. So there's that. Uh, keep in mind too that I, I still have open the option for replacing one of your unit assignments if you missed one or didn't do very well on one. And that will, that option remains open until the last day of class, which is the 13th. I can't remember right now if I put a time deadline on the 13th, but uh, no, no need to wait, no reason to wait. Um, I guess we're getting out of midterm season as well, because I think we're not allowed to give you midterms in the last two weeks of class. I guess it's paper crunch time though, and thesis crunch time, and all those other things, depending on what subject that you are in. All right, sound okay for online folks? Just let me know if it's too low, too high, whatever, and uh, I can adjust. So we're gonna start a new unit. We're gonna talk about pesticides, and, and like many of the units that we're gonna be talking about or have been talking about all semester, uh, it's hard to do justice to one of these topics in just a single class or single unit. You know, this could be an entire degree and there's many, many people spent full PhDs for four years studying just in the area of pesticides, devoted their careers to it. So we're just gonna be scratching the surface. We're not gonna be very comprehensive. We're gonna talk about a couple of important issues. And, and my goal really too is to link what we're gonna be talking about to general principles that we've been learning all semester long. So we're going to be looking at toxicity and we're going to be looking at, you know, things like polarity, things like environmental fate, all these kinds of things that we've been discussing all the way along. <clears throat> Sound is good for, until my voice goes, I guess, right? And then, um, so pesticides is just a sort of a catch-all term, meaning it's, it's some chemical typically chemical substance that we use to kill something. And we wanna do this to protect generally crops or forests or some other, uh, other resource. We wanna kill some species of something uh, that we don't want to exist anymore. So this could mean insects. So about 17% of pesticides that are used are to kill insect pests. Um, Herbicides are the biggest one, 40%. And so this is usually to kill weeds, weed killers, and it's, you, these are used extensively in agriculture and farming because you want your fertilizer and water and all that to go into the crops and not into uh, some other organism. Uh, fungicides is 10%, and then other is 33%, and other 
includes a whole bunch of different things, you know, whether you want to kill algae or mites or antimicrobials or uh, mollusks or birds or whatever, you know, they're all different things that you may want to target. And if you think about the ideal pesticide, it would be one that is extremely damaging and toxic to the target organism and poses no risks to all other organisms. Now, unfortunately, usually life isn't that simple. Usually um, any chemical substance has risks for pretty well any population in certain amounts. And so pesticides have this sort of huge environmental element to the, air, the, the subject, the topic, where we have to be considering uh, what else, what non-target species and how these are being impacted by our pesticide use. So if we go way back in time, human beings have been using pesticides for a long, long, long time. Uh, we have evidence as long ago as 4,500 years ago. So this was what, 2,500 BC, more or less, 2,400 BC. Uh, yeah, 20, yeah, three, yeah, anyway, trying to do math here. Um, of people using sulfur, elemental sulfur. And sulfur is a pure elemental compound that is bright yellow in color when you have it in the pure form. And sulfur can exist in its pure elemental form naturally underground. You can find it uh, if you're digging and it can be, it's very obvious, it's very uh, characteristically yellow. And so ancient peoples realized that they could mine this material, grind it up and spread this dust on plants and it would uh, protect the plants against certain diseases. So very early on, people were using this. Does anyone recognize this picture, by the way, where this is? This is in Vancouver. And the picture is taken from the seawall, which is a kind of a pedestrian road that goes around Stanley Park, right downtown. And you can see across the water, there's this huge pile of yellow sulfur on the, on the docks there. You zoom in, it looks like this. And you can see how, how huge this pile is. You know, that's a, like a building that obviously someone could walk into. Um, so, so this is a, a huge, huge, huge pile of sulfur. And where the sulfur comes from is from natural gas, typically from Alberta. And what happens is natural gas, which is mostly methane, also contains H2S, which is a very smelly compound, which can be converted into sulfur. And when the sulfur is then extracted out of the gas, when it's in the gas, we call the gas sour gas, you take it out in a refinery, it becomes sulfur, it is put on trains to Vancouver, and at Vancouver it's loaded onto ships and carried over to Asia. It can be burned in the presence of O2 to make, uh, and water to make sulfuric acid. It can be also used, I believe, in the vulcanization process to make rubber tires, to make t rubber really tough. You can vulcanize it, which also makes use of sulfur. So this white material can also be used as a pesticide. And actually, this is still something that you can go buy. If you go to a gardening center in a store, some places will sell these shaker bottles of sulfur as a remedy for certain types of plant diseases. Typically fungal infections, I believe. So people early on, you know, realized, you know, lots of like biblical stories of uh, plagues of locusts coming and devastating crops um, well back, you know, thousands of years. And so people have been fighting against uh, natural organisms that also want to eat the same delicious foods that we want to eat. And people realize, well, if something is very toxic, it can probably kill insects. It may kill us too, but if you can dose it just right, maybe we can kill the insects and not kill ourselves. And people knew early on that many metals can be very toxic. Things like arsenic, mercury, and lead. You can make compounds of these metals and that can be spread on plants. And this was actually done quite a bit in the Annapolis Valley. Uh, a lot of pesticides used on apples contained arsenic way back when, you know, not currently, but decades ago. And for that reason, in many spots in the valley, you can find elevated arsenic levels still to this day in the soil as a result of all of this arsenic pesticide use. 
Now we don't use heavy metals really anymore, certainly in North America, uh, but these heavy metals obviously are not only toxic to insects and other things, they'll also be toxic to us. The other problem with these metals is once they get into the soils, they can either stay there and build up over time, or they can wash out and end up in rivers and lakes and so on. So we can contaminate our environment quite easily by using metals like this as a pesticide. So we have a question. We have about a dozen or so questions from this unit. And uh, please flag me down if that didn't activate itself like it should have. Yeah, looks good, great. Um, which of the following was not used historically as a pesticide? Mercury, arsenic, sulfur, or polonium? Polonium is the answer to this one. Polonium was that highly radioactive substance that was discovered by Marie Curie. Uh, it'd be too, first of all, too expensive to use, but second of all, you wouldn't want to make your farmland radioactive, so definitely a bad choice. We talked a little bit towards the beginning of the course about this dichotomy between natural and artificial, and how many people believe that, that uh, organic foods are ones that don't use any pesticides, that don't use herbicides or insecticides or anything like that. Um, where we know that's not the case. We know that organic foods certainly can use pesticides and, and so on, but they have to be derived from a natural origin. That's what defines an allowable pesticide in organic uh, farming. And when I say allowable, what does that even mean? Well, the government actually regulates the marketing of organic products and, it, and uh, Environment Canada, or maybe it's Agriculture Canada, they put out a list of allowable substances that you can use and still call your crops organic crops. The World Health Organization also, you know, has spent quite a bit of time looking at possible toxic effects on human beings of different pesticides. And what they've done is they've developed this, this hazard scale specifically for pesticides with sort of descriptive terms to describe how dangerous these are to us in terms of acute toxicity. So we have the extremely hazardous ones, and these have LD50 for a rat, less than five milligrams per kilogram body weight. Five to 50 is highly hazardous. Moderately hazardous is 50 to 2,000. Slightly hazardous, over 2,000. Over 5,000 is unlikely to present an acute hazard. So these would be something that'd be extremely non-toxic to us. All right, organic agriculture only allows pesticides to be used that are what? Non-toxic, slightly toxic, not chemicals, naturally derived, or no pesticides are allowed in organic farming. The answer is D, naturally derived. By the way, whether they're naturally or derived or not doesn't tell you anything about which of these classes that particular pesticide might fall into. So we're gonna be looking at some, some key, I would say, organic pesticides, as well as some key synthetic pesticides. The synthetic pesticides by far are used much more in terms of quantity for agriculture today. Um, despite the growth of organic farming and foods in recent decades, um, it's still very much a niche, like it's still very much a, a small fraction of the type of farming that takes place. Okay, so this is the Government of Canada list, updated back in 2011, of what substances are permitted to be used for organic farming. So if you want to become an organic farmer, you'd go online, you download this list, and before you used anything on your land or your crops, you'd want to check to make sure that you can no longer certify your crops as organic if you, if you uh, use something on this list. So just a few of them, um, you can kind of get an idea, like plastic row covers is okay, I guess, even though plastic is not a natural material, um, it doesn't end up in the plant or in the soil. And we have things like potassium bicarbonate, which is a, a close relative to baking soda. We have pH buffers, we have uh, various things. Uh, but one thing that's down here on the list is rotenone. And rotenone is, uh, an insecticide, and you'd put that, of course, on your plants to keep bugs from eating it. And if you've ever been involved in farming at all, if you've ever grown potatoes, for example, and you see these 
Colorado beetles, the potato bugs on your plants, eating all of your uh, effort, then your, your mind goes to this immediately. How can I get rid of these things? So rhodonone actually is a very complex molecule. This is its molecular structure. It's been extracted from plants, purified, and then characterized, and chemists have determined what the structure is. It comes from the seeds of the jacama plant, and the jacama plant is a, is a root plant, the tuber, which looks sort of like this, and uh, grows in warmer climates than the one we are in right now. You can take the seeds, you can crush them, you can extract out this material, and then you could make, I guess, mixtures of that material with water, spray it on your plants, and this will kill or deter, at least, insects. And you wonder, you know, why is that in the seeds of the plant? And it kind of makes sense, you know, the plant itself doesn't want to be eaten by insects. And that's true of any plant, you know, they don't want, they're not there to be insect food, they're there to grow and grow tall and distribute their seeds. So plants have evolved over the years chemical defenses against many pests, many different insects. And often what you'll find if you get into farming uh, or, or gardening is for some plant that you will grow, there'll be this one insect that will eat that plant and nothing else. And it's an insect you've never seen before in your life, but you start to plant, uh, you know, you name it, you start to plant uh, broccoli or you start to plant potatoes or you start to plant whatever. This one insect will appear all of a sudden in your garden you've never seen before and that's the only thing that'll eat it. And so there's, I think I talked about this before, about this arms race between things that eat plants and then plants that are eaten, where plants will evolve a, some chemical that it can produce inside of itself to protect itself, to poison its enemies, basically. And then you'll find insects will evolve a defense mechanism against that one chemical. And it keeps going back and forth. And has for, for millions of years. So many plants naturally contain molecules that have really no function in the plant except to poison other pests, okay? This is actually the purpose of uh, capsaicin, I believe, in hot peppers. It doesn't do anything for the plant except it makes them inedible or less edible or less attractive as an edible choice for many other organisms. So you can take this, you can spray this all you want because this is on the list and you can still call your, your, your plant, your, your produce, organic produce. So rotenone, you know, like any chemical, has a certain toxicity profile. It'll have a certain toxicity to insects, a certain toxicity to us, just like water, just like everything. And it falls into the WHO classification of moderately hazardous. So it's in the sort of 50 to 2,000 milligram per kilogram range. Um, so, so, you know, it's not, just because it's natural certainly doesn't mean it's non-toxic, but it's also, certainly not at the top of this list. It's not, you know, one of the pesticides with the most extreme toxicity profile. In fact, you're going to find very few chemicals in that very top range because essentially any one that would end up in that range has been already phased out, right? Pyrethrum is another one that's on this list, just a few up from Rotenone. That's on the allowable uh, organic farming uh, chemicals. And it has this chemical structure, again, very complex. And, you know, just, just so you're aware, I'm never going to show you a molecule like this and ask you what it is, unless it's something very basic like H2O or CO2, right? I'm not going to expect you to recognize that this is pyrethrin and this is rotenone, for example, just by looking at the structure. I don't know if I could do it myself, so I'm certainly not going to expect uh, you to be doing it as well. All right. So pyrethrins are extracted from chrysanthemum flowers. And there's actually a, a famous story way back, I believe, in Roman times of uh, some army. I, I don't know who it was fighting who, but they were completely outnumbered, this army. And so what they did to win this battle is they retreated through this meadow uh, where they knew the oncoming army was going to have to camp for the night. So this place apparently was loaded with uh, chrysanthemum flowers all over the place. And because there was, there was lots of flowers in this meadow, 
there was also lots of bees and beehives. And so what they, what had happened was apparently the, the invading soldiers set up their camp and then they went around and they broke up a whole bunch of beehives and took all the honey and they feasted on the honey. It turns out the honey was toxic because the bees were collecting the nectar from the chrysanthemum flowers, which contain this poison, pyrethrin, and that caused them, it didn't kill them, but it made them very like sick and, and sluggish. And they came in at night when they're in this state and then killed them all and defeated the oncoming army that way. I, I really ought to look up the actual details. Like this is Roman times. This is like very, very old and very well may not be true, but as a st story I heard all the same. Um, but yeah, bee, like honey from bees actually has, uh, contains a signature of wh what plants the nectar was collected from. And so you'll see in, in Nova Scotia in certain sp spots where um, bees will be near places where they grow a lot of blueberries. And I think blueberry nectar honey is apparently of what, like a higher grade of honey than field flowers or whatever else. But anyway, chrysanthemums, which are, you know, decorative flowers that we grow for decorative reasons, do produce these pyrethrins, which we can also extract and then use them in organic farming to kill things. These also fall into this mo moderately hazardous classification, which is admittedly a, a pretty broad range of LD50 values. So, so this moderately hazardous, what this really means is you know, if you had a bottle of this in your garage and you had small kids, you'd want to put it up high so your kid didn't actually dr accidentally drink it. But it's not like if you spray it on your lawn, you're going to walk through your lawn and drop dead. Hopefully. What natural pesticide is derived from chrysanthemum flowers? Pyrethrin. So synthetic pesticides, um, have been, for the last hundred years or so, a big deal for us as well. One of the most notorious ones that you hear about less nowadays, but certainly was probably the number one pesticide for a long time, was DDT. DDT, first made in 1874 by organic chemists. They synthesized it in the lab. It's not a naturally occurring compound. And it has this structure with lots of carbons, hydrogens, and chlorines. And many chlorinated substances, and we've seen maybe a few examples already, tend to be very persistent in the environment. We saw that CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, were very persistent in the atmosphere. We saw, what was it, tetrachloroparadioxin. We talked about that one, TCDD, uh, as a product that you make when you burn PVC. It's also very toxic and also uh, persistent in the environment. DDT was found to be, um, relatively non-toxic to humans and mammals, but quite potent at killing insects. And this discovery was made back in 1939, which um, conveniently was also the beginning of World War II, where a lot of people were traveling to environments with new and exotic insects that they haven't been exposed to in the past. So DDT became a very popular substance, it's produced in huge amounts, to kill insects. So in, in military, for example, it was used a lot um, to de-louse soldiers, where soldiers would be basically dosed with this stuff, and you can kind of see uh, this, this person is being dosed with it right now. And what this, is hap what this is doing is it'll kill lice, it'll kill fleas, or any kind of insects that are on the surface of your body that it'll come into contact with. And people understood this has relatively low acute toxicity, so exposing yourself to DDT in this way isn't going to make you sick or die or anything like that in the short term. Its toxicity was moderate as well. It was in the same camp as those other ones that we had talked about. Uh, so, you know, it, it, you, you had to respect it, I guess, but it wasn't something you feared in terms of its, its acute toxicity. Nobel Prize in 1948. Uh, went to Paul Mueller for his discovery that DDT was a very potent insecticide. So one of the main insect species that DDT was brought out to fight was insects. Insects. Mosquitoes. Because mosquitoes are vectors of many diseases 
most notably um, uh, malaria. There we go. So spe certain species of mosquito. We also hear some other ones. Uh, you don't hear about this recently, but Zika virus. Remember Zika virus is a big deal in warmer places than here um, where people were getting this infection again through mosquitoes. And you don't hear about uh, malaria very much in the US anymore, but malaria used to be a big problem in the US. And so what they did when they discovered DDT killed mosquitoes is they went on huge DDT spraying missions where they would drop tons of DDT out of planes and spread it over forests, over uh, tip typically over um, uh, wetlands where mosquitoes are known to breed. And they were trying to really put a punishing down on the insect population, on the, on, the, on the mosquito population to prevent spread of malaria. So this is my limerick for DDT. A mosquito was heard to complain that a chemist had poisoned his brain. The cause of his sorrow was paradichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane. And that's the chemical name for DDT. So I guess there's a DDT, that's where the name comes from, abbreviation of the chemical name. So DDT production in the US, you know, started in probably 1939 at residual levels. By the middle of the war, it was really starting to ramp up. And it peaked probably early 60s that you see here at 80,000 metric tons a year. So that's huge, huge amounts of this material. This is malaria incidence in the US. And this is, um, I'm not sure if this is total numbers or if it's cases per 10,000, which is a typical measure for incidences of certain diseases. And this is a log scale, meaning every tick on this scale is a factor of 10 difference. And you can see in the early 30s, it was around 100 per 10,000 Americans. And by the time after these spraying programs and these lines refer to a number of different spraying programs in the US for different regions, they got that number down to less than 0.1. So they were able to suppress the incidence of malaria in the US by about a factor of 1,000, which is a huge success, right, in terms of eliminating disease. And at the time, they didn't have any idea. They figured that this had no environmental consequences either, or at least they didn't seem to be too worried about possible environmental consequences. And this is just the US. This was done all over the world. Less so in Canada, because we don't have the type of mosquito that will carry diseases typically, um, but certainly in a lot of African nations, and I believe in Madagascar, is it Madagascar? They were reporting around a million cases, I don't even know, I forget the, I forget the uh, stat, so I'm not gonna say it, because that's probably gonna be wrong. Ryan says, now the military just used permethrin, so there we go. Another insecticide. Um, so heavy spraying for malaria um, until it started to drop. Well, obviously the cases of malaria started to drop dramatically and they started to rise again in the mid sixties. And part of this was because of uh, the development of resistance against DDT in certain species. So this is a, a problem that we're seeing Almost any time we develop a chemical weapon against some species that we're trying to eradicate, like antibiotics for bacterial infections in our bodies, or like DDT for, for um, mosquitoes, or you name it, eventually what happens is the, the organism evolves and it develops resistance against that particular weapon which is a good thing for chemists because that means we're never going to be out of business. There's always going to be new weapons we have to create. And that, that might sound evil that we're creating weapons to destroy other species, but really that's what a lot of medicine is, right? We're trying to destroy organisms in our body, except for our, ourselves. All right, so one of the problems with DDT is it's very nonpolar. I'm going to go back to where you can see the structure and just look at that structure for a second. There's no OHs on this molecule. There's no NHs on this molecule, no hydrogen bonding. So this is not water soluble. It's, it's kind of uh, 
an oily kind of material, and so it doesn't dissolve in water very well at all. And compounds that are like that, compounds that are nonpolar and also not very water soluble, will often exhibit this property we call biomagnification. And so what happens is, is our bodies actually contain a lot of nonpolar materials. The membranes for around each of our cells have a nonpolar interior, and all of our fat cells are also nonpolar molecules as well. So what happens for organisms that are living in water, when nonpolar material ends up in that water, that can often concentrate in the fatty tissues of those organisms, which at the very base level is maybe microorganisms or algae or things like that, and that gets eaten by something else, and it gets concentrated as you go higher and higher up the food chain. And we saw this already, I believe, for certain mercury compounds that are biomagnified and you find in higher amounts in top predator fish like sharks. But DDT is the same sort of thing, uh, and it en ended up in birds, primarily, because, you know, it starts out in certain concentrations in water, gets concentrated by the producers, gets concentrated up, small fish, large fish, and then those get eaten by the birds. The birds will then eat the fish, and the fish oils will contain the highest concentrations of DDT, and the birds will end up with very, very high concentrations in their bodies. So this process of biomagnification is this increasing concentration of this nonpolar substance all the way up the food chain. And how can you predict if something's going to biomagnify or not? Well, if it's nonpolar and very, very durable in the environment, it has a possibility or probability of undergoing biomagnification. All right. 1962, a very influential book was published by Rachel Carson. The title of this book was Silent Spring, and this was a book which detailed the growing science at the time, which was linking the indiscriminate spraying of DDT into the environment with declining bird populations. And the idea behind the title, Silent Spring, is this idea that there may come a spring where we won't hear birds singing anymore because of DDT primarily was the one that was the focus of this book, but other ones as well. So around this time, people were starting to realize that certain top predatory bird species like eagles and condors and osprey and things like this, uh, that their populations were declining and they were able to connect that to concentrations of DDT that they were finding in the bird samples of the dead birds. This book was, you know, certainly very influential in terms of public awareness around possible negative effects of DDT, but this is a long time ago, 1962. This was one of the very first publications at all raising alarm about environmental risks of any chemical use that we were using. Right? There's a lot of things that would seem almost unthinkable to us today that were very common practice in the 1960s and well past the 1960s. One thing, for example, is uh, you need to change the oil in your car. What was very common is you drive your car to a field somewhere, unscrew the cap, and then just walk away for a few hours, drain all the oil down into the field, and then pour fresh oil in and drive back. Right? Very, very common. In fact, what was also very common is people would have a drain in their garage and they would just drain it right into the drain while it was parked in their garage. And it's actually illegal now to build a home with a garage with a floor drain because they don't want to make it easy for people to drain oil through a floor drain in the garage anymore. Um, so this book was credited as being perhaps the turning point in public awareness around environmental issues. It's believed that this book really kick-started the environmental movement in the US and by corollary, Canada, Europe, and other places. So one bird species in particular that was the focus of this was uh, peregrine falcons, which are, of course, predatory birds. They would eat fish, they would eat any other small animals that they'd get a, get a hold of. And what they were able, what they were finding the DDT was causing in the bodies of these, of these birds is that they would lay eggs, I guess like normal, except the shells that they were, of the eggs that they were laying were much thinner than normal. 
So birds, of course, lay eggs, and then they like to sit on the eggs to incubate them. And what was happening is very often these eggs would just get crushed when the bird would sit on them because the egg shells were so thin. And losses in terms of uh, chick mortality, or we wouldn't even get to the chick phase, started to grow and grow and grow. And then these birds weren't reproducing, and then, of course, their numbers plummeted. So this is what they did for the peregrine falcon is they took eggshell samples from thousands of, of shell samples that they could find. Many of these were historic samples that they could find in different uh, universities and places like that, collections and so on. And then of course they were collecting them out in the environment and whatnot. And so what these are, these are, are thicknesses of eggshells over the years up until the mid 1940s when DDT spraying programs began. And what you can see is, you know, that's probably a good line of best fit through the data up to that point. And this would be the data of best fit after. So there's a significant reduction in egg thickness after the DDT pro spraying programs began. It was correlated with DDT concentrations in the animal's blood. And they believe this was the cause of the bird population decline. Now the bald eagles were one that was, was a very interesting one. If you live in the valley and you go for drives around the valley, you may be of the impression that, you know, bald eagles, there's no problem with our bald eagle, eagle populations. You can look up at any point in time in Wolfville sometimes and see three or four of them flying around. They seem very plentiful in the valley and very common to have around here. But there was a time in the U.S. where they were on the brink of extinction. Back in the early 60s or mid 60s, there were only around 500 uh, bald eagles breeding pairs that were known to exist. And in the US, what they were doing for years and years is they would have these annual bird counts where what they would do is they'd get people to go out and they would keep very careful notes of birds and they'd count how many nests they would find in a certain area. And based on the data that they got, they would extrapolate to the areas that weren't explored and they were able to come up with a bird count for that year. And years, where it has this little ziggy thing here, uh, were years that they don't have complete data for the US. But this is like countrywide, and this is actual numbers. Like these aren't times 10 to the five or something like that. So 500 breeding pairs in the entire US. I wouldn't be surprised to learn there was 500 breeding pairs right now in the valley, right? If you look around and you see them all over the place, there could easily be 500 in the valley right now spread over the whole country of the US, and particularly the bald eagle being sort of the national iconic bird of the US, this was considered to be a big problem. And you can see 63 to 74 in that decade, the, the numbers had barely changed. And so when this became, a, when this awareness started, which you remember that book was published in 1962, Silent Spring, uh, this led to sort of an abrupt halting of DDT spraying programs Progress was slow at first, you know, the numbers, they were growing a little bit. But remember, DDT has a very long lifetime in the environment. Just because you stop spraying today does not mean that the problem is over and you're just going to get a quick rebound. But over the intervening decades, you can see the numbers did go up. By 2006, the numbers were up to around 10,000. And at that point, they stopped doing the counts because they figured we're, we're, we're not down at the danger levels anymore. You know, the, the, the species has rebounded. And in fact, it's believed that the valley here in Nova Scotia has played a very important role in incubating populations of bald eagles, uh, which allowed them to rebound. And I, I know for a period of time, I think it was in the 90s when they were trying to really uh, promote the populations of bald eagles as much as possible. First thing that went into effect, of course, was laws to prevent you from shooting them. But they, uh, a lot of uh, chicken farms were feeding bald eagles with uh, chickens that had died or that they couldn't process or whatever. And uh, you could see uh, lots of examples of that around the valley. So I'm not sure if they actually captured them and released them in the US or they just migrated. But anyway, we became a safe haven for them because we weren't spraying DDT here to any significant extent. We weren't broadcast spraying um, natural areas to kill mosquitoes. Um, we are top predators too. We eat fish, we eat bird eggs, we eat all kinds of things. 
And so for this reason, people were also concerned about the potential effects of DDT on us. And even though it's not acutely toxic, could it be chronic, could have chronic effects in human beings over long periods of time? So what they did is they actually collected blood samples of people in various years, many people found averages, and checked to see how much DDT we have in our blood. And you can see these levels, and I think these levels are in units of parts per trillion, very, very low concentrations. But you see, uh, starting in 1950, they started to go up. The use of DDT started during World War II, you might remember, 1943 or so. And it peaked early 60s, and then DDT was sort of phased out, and you see DDT levels have dropped down. So by 1978, um, DDT levels had sort of dropped back down to the 1950 level, and I don't know what they are today, but I'm sure they're very close to zero, because a lot of time has passed since 1978, and DDT has been phased out. It's been banned in most countries. What book is considered to have been an, an important trigger for the environmental movement? That is Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. The first environmentalist, maybe. Uh, what environmental problem is associated with DDT? And that is decline of predatory bird populations. And yeah. And when I say that wasn't the only reason, like, I guess you could say they were like the canary in the coal mine, in a sense, that if certain target species start to have severe population effects, the question then becomes, okay, if that dies out, what's next? All right, another pesticide that we're going to be talking about, which is uh, uh, quite notorious, is one called Agent Orange. And Agent Orange was used extensively by the U.S. in the late 70s during the Vietnam War. And, or was that the late 60s? I think it was the late 60s during the Vietnam War. And this is a picture of a, of a helicopter spraying Agent Orange. Uh, Agent Orange is a chemical that we would call a defoliant. Meaning it kills plants. And the reason they were spraying it is because there was a lot of guerrilla warfare during the, the um, uh, yeah, I, I said Korean War, Vietnam War. A lot of uh, guerrilla warfare where, people, where soldiers would be kind of hiding in the bush, hiding in, in dense undergrowth and so on. And the U.S. wanted to expose soldiers, and so they would spray just into the jungle, into the forest, to try to kill plants off to prevent pr the, those spaces from having plants that could provide people with, with shelter and camouflage and so on. Uh, they also used it on crops to kill crops, realizing that if the population didn't have food, they couldn't effectively fight back. And it was actually pretty terrible, a lot of the effects that Agent Orange has on the population and continues to have today. So Agent Orange is primarily a 50-50 mix of two different chemicals that are chemically related to each other. Those two chemicals are called 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. And I'll give you the structures of those. This was a um, production of barrels of this stuff that was then shipped overseas and used in the Vietnam War. These are the two chemicals, 2,4-D, and the 2,4-D refers to the numbering of the chemical structure. So this chemical structure would have, we would number the carbons where the oxygen is number one, two, three, four, five, six. So the 2,4-D means two comma four, Dichloro. The D is for dichloro. So we have chlorines on carbons two and carbons four. And the other one, 245T, is one, two, three, four, five. 245 and the T is trichloro. So they're, they're closely related chemical species to each other. One of them just has an extra chlorine. And you can see this map of, uh, of Vietnam and the areas that were sprayed starting in the mid-1960s. All the areas in red were heavily sprayed. So huge, huge, huge amounts, tons and tons and tons of this material was, was used to try to kill back plants. Um, one of the problems though with these compounds is one of the two com components of the mixture, the 2,4,5-T, underwent a chemical reaction 
during the production where two of them came together and reacted together using a, a reaction you might learn in uh, organic two, if anyone takes organic chem, to make this compound TCDD, tetrachloroparadioxin. Do you remember this one? This was the chemical that's produced in small amounts when you burn vinyl, plastic. It's also produced in relatively large amounts when you were making this particular compound. Um, Agent Orange was synthesized by a very infamous US chemical company called Monsanto. And Monsanto was producing this and they knew when they were producing it for the US Army that it was tainted with around 1% of this extremely toxic tetrachloroparadioxin. This was the chemical that we said uh, caused chloracne, it causes darkening of the skin, um, like it makes it all mottled looking. And it's also the most toxic man-made chemical that we are aware of, that we have access to. So this was present in there and they actually, you know, before you maybe villainize Monsanto too hard about putting this extremely toxic material and spraying it widely over a country, is they were aware this was present as an impurity and they went to the US military and said like, yeah, we can keep continue producing, but we are aware of this impurity, which is like, has really bad health effects. And um, we think we need to work on purifying this material before we can give it to you. And they, the US military said, no, no, we don't, we don't care. We just need as much as you can give us right now. Don't, we don't care if it's pure or not. So the US military, I guess, is the one to blame. I guess they're both to blame, but for spraying this material just wholesale over the country like this. And if you Google like um, Agent Orange health impacts or something like that and look at the images, huge, 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 thousands and thousands and thousands of babies were born in Vietnam in the years afterwards with extreme birth defects as a result of this. So not only is it super acutely toxic, but also can have down the road effects as well. Um, this is, this is Gagetown. And this is a, you know, a Canadian Armed Forces base. And there was an area just outside Gagetown where they did some uh, test spraying of Agent Orange. And so the residents of the area, this only came to light, I believe, relatively recently, maybe about five years ago, is they realized this became unclassified, I guess, or whatever. And there was a lot of people in the surrounding area that suffered similar sorts of health effects as the people in Vietnam did. And um, I believe there was quite a, a lawsuit and there was a compensation provided. I don't know the exact details of how this all worked out in the end, but uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a local problem to a certain extent as well. Now, Agent Orange, remember we said it's two chemicals, primarily 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. You can still buy one of those two components, 2,4-D. The 2,4-5-T is the bad one because it can make the dioxin. 2,4-5-D doesn't, and it can be purified. And you can go buy it. You know, you can go to um, Home Hardware downtown Wolfville right now and buy a jug of this stuff called Killex. And it's sold as what's called a selective weed killer. So it's um, a broad leaf weed killer. So I'm not, a, I'm not a plant biologist, but I do understand that plants come in sort of two main branches. There are broad leaf plants, and then there are, which are called dicots, and then there's another type, which is called monocots. So if you look at the leaves of a plant, if all of the veins in the leaves are parallel to each other, like you would find in grass, and like you would find in plants like corn, those are monocot plants, which I, I, I forget my grade 12 biology, what makes them different. But dicot plants are ones where there's like a central vein going up the leaf and then there's branches off the central. So most trees would be an example of, of a dicot. Most weeds are also dicots as well. Uh, so this is sold for people to spray on their lawns because they want, because this herbicide will kill the broadleaf plants, the dicots, and not affect the monocots, okay? So it won't affect your grass, but it will affect any weeds that are present in your grass. This is very, very popular as a spray for people to put on their grass if they wanna get rid of the weeds and not affect 
the actual grass that's in there. So yeah, it's 50% of Agent Orange is what you're using if you're using that particular stuff. Um, this is one where it's somewhat controversial. If you're walking around and you, you see somebody's lawn that's been sprayed, it may have been sprayed with this particular material. It may have been sprayed with something else. Often people will spray for singe bugs as well on their lawn. Um, but you might see these warnings on, on, on grass from time to time. There's been a lot of work being done uh, because there have been suggestions that this chemical 2,4-D has been linked to certain types of cancer and that areas that are heavily sprayed can elevate your risk of developing certain types of cancer. Uh, so there is some evidence that supports this connection, but it's very weak. There is definitely a lack of high quality studies which, which can definitively show that there's a relationship between 2,4-D and cancer. So is there one? Well, I think it's yet to be determined. And even when I say a link to cancer, what does that actually mean? Well, you know, if you sprayed huge amounts of this, if this is your job to go out and spray every day, if you're a groundskeeper, for example, your exposure would be very different than if you sprayed your lawn once a year. Nevertheless, if you ask me, having weeds in your lawn is a pretty uh, small benefit. You know, I know people will disagree with me. Some people are very careful with their lawns. If you've ever seen me, my lawn, if you uh, sprayed this on my lawn, my lawn would turn brown because there's, I don't think there's any real grass there anymore. It's just random other plants. I have a lot of biodiversity in my lawn, uh, which I guess is a good thing. Um, so is this stuff dangerous? Well, to me, it, it all, like with any chemical, comes down to a risk benefit assessment that you need to do. And for me, the, even if it was completely safe, the risk of you know, it costing money probably wouldn't be worth it to me. And an afternoon of my time to spray my lawn wouldn't be worth it right there. So I'd say you know, the benefit of this is so small in my mind. Where if I was a farmer and my crop depended on my use of a certain pesticide, I'm sure I would think very differently, right? And we need food. That's different, we don't need lawns. And maybe if you're a golfer, you disagree. Ryan says, if anyone is interested in the Gagetown Agent Orange issue, you have some info for us, do you? If so, you can send it to me and I can link it on our page, our ACORN page. All right, this is what Health Canada says back in 2008 regarding 2,4-D. Um, it's concluded as re-evaluation of 2,4-D. It's determined that it meets Canada's strict health and safety standards and as such can continue to be sold and used in Canada. What I have seen though is that there's many uh, neighborhoods or streets or communities that have a type of law which we call a covenant, which means if you purchase a house in this area, you are bound to certain laws uh, that are not sort of national or provincial level laws. They're, they're specific to that one area. It's almost like a contract for living in that particular community. And um, so an example, some of them, sometimes these are ridiculous. I had a friend who lived in a place that had a covenant that your Christmas lights could only be white. So some things are like that. But I know there are places that ban spraying of certain pesticides in certain areas. I'd say probably the risk of 2,4-D would be small if you're somebody who just sprays your lawn and then leaves. The risk would be greater if you have an animal, like a dog, that runs around the lawn all the time, or small kids that play in the lawn all the time. Again, something to be weighed. Also, of course, follow the instructions. Don't use 40 times what it says to use on the packaging. In terms of acute toxicity, it's you know moderately hazardous, like everything else we've seen so far. Not particularly concerning from that perspective. Ryan tells me he's got a URL. Uh, I don't see a URL though. Maybe if you could repaste that, we could post it somewhere. What war did the US engage in a heavy Agent Orange spraying program? It was the Vietnam War, late 1960s. It was not the War of 1812. What highly toxic compound was found as a contaminant in Agent Orange and is responsible for the majority of the health problems? 
that was the TCDD, the tetrachloroparadioxin. And uh, I guess it's, what is it, diphenyldioxin, dichlorodiphenyldioxin, um, which is the same molecule that you get from burning vinyl plastic. So very stable molecule, very persistent in the environment, takes a long time to break down. Oh, so somebody pasted a URL. Ryan, if you could email me the URL you're talking about, I can post it. Uh, yeah, he, he's trying to post a, a, a URL about the Gagetown Agent Orange Spraying, but YouTube keeps deleting it, so that's why we can't see it. What common, commonly used broadleaf herbicide is a component of Agent Orange? And that's 2,4-D. 2,4-5-T is also in Agent Orange, and a little bit, little smattering of TCDD. So arguably, I guess, like Agent Orange could be like 100 times less dangerous if you were able to purify it and get rid of it, that little bit. All right, on to the next one. And this is the number one herbicide that's used in agriculture right now in the US and probably in Canada too. It's called glyphosate. You, it's also produced by Monsanto. So Monsanto has brought us all kinds of uh, wonderful and fun things. Um, it is, goes by the trade name Roundup. So if you've heard of the herbicide Roundup, it's glyphosate, which is this chemical structure. One thing you may notice about the structure, it's got an OH. It's got an NH, two OHs over here. This thing is highly, highly, highly water soluble. Why? Because it has OHs and NHs, which give it hydrogen bonding, which allow it to dissolve very well in water, right? So it makes Monsanto, and Monsanto, I guess, this chemical in my mind gets a lot of unfair criticism. Because this chemical itself, in many respects, is an ideal herbicide. And why is it ideal? Um, well, number one, practically, it's, it's cheap to produce. It's soluble in water, which means it's easy to spray. It's easy to broadcast. You can put it through an irrigation system. Um, but when I say it's ideal, it's because it's extremely low to toxicity to non-target species, like insects and humans and wildlife. The other thing about glyphosate is that when it touches soil, it binds very strongly to minerals in the soil. So what that means is if it spills or you spray too much or if it rains right after, it will not wash through the soil and end up in waterways. It gets fixed very quickly. Another important feature of glyphosate is that it has a very short lifetime in the environment. It de decomposes very readily, and I think it has a half-life under ideal conditions of a couple of weeks. So it will not accumulate. You can use it year in, year out, and it doesn't build up in the soil, which is not the case with other things like DDT or those metals we were talking about at the start of the course, like arsenic, mercury, and things like that. Thanks, Ryan sent me the link, so I'll post that up. But Monsanto, part of the reason why Roundup is so vilified is not because of its toxicity or if it's environmental effects or these sorts of things. It's due to the fact that it's also caught up with a completely separate issue, which is the issue of genetically modified foods. So GM foods, it's a, it's a new technology. I remember when it came out probably in the early 90s and there was a lot of concern. There's a lot of concern certainly at the time uh, about the fact that these have not undergone long-term testing. There's been huge extensive testing now since the 90s. Uh, all papers, all reports are coming out that these things are very safe. But the reason why Monsanto is in the middle of this is Monsanto developed a number of seed lines that are genetically modified to be resistant to Roundup. Roundup will kill anything. It's not like 2,4-D that is specific to certain types of plants. Roundup will kill any type of plant. So what they were able to do is put certain genes into certain crop plants that would allow them to resist the effects of Roundup. And then what you could do is just spray an entire field of corn. And if your corn was what's called Roundup Ready, which is the GM corn, which is the majority of corn that's grown in North America now, um, you could, it would kill everything except for that corn. 
So it was a very easy way of applying a selective herbicide and allowing only one plant to grow. Okay, so they had Roundup soybeans, uh, Roundup ready corn. There's no Roundup ready wheat though, for whatever reason, it doesn't exist. So of course there's all kinds of people um, stoking fear about GM foods, about uh, Roundup as a byproduct of that. And remember, dioxins in Agent Orange also came from Monsanto, so their, their history haunts them to a certain extent as well around this. Probably, I guess, there was, it seemed like a period of time where Netflix had a whole bunch of documentaries up there about people making documentaries about Monsanto. And, you know, I'm not going to defend them or their business practices, but in terms of the evidence, the scientific evidence, there's really nothing to be concerned about with genetically modified foods uh, at all. So I said one of the benefits of glyphosate is the fact that it is very low toxicity. It is the first one we're going to look at that's not in this moderately hazardous category. It's in the slightly hazardous category, uh, which is good. One of the least toxic pesticides in common use. In fact, it's less toxic than all of the ones we've looked at that were in the organic farming list, right? That's in terms of acute toxicity. So in terms of uh, long-term toxicity, we know this can be measured as well. We know that this is measured in terms of NOAEL for a different species. It's tested on rats and the NOAEL was found to be 31 milligrams per kilogram body weight. And that then is divided by 100 to produce our ADI for humans, which is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So if you weighed 60 kilograms, 132 pounds a uh, person, that would be a pretty light person, I guess. But uh, that means if you weigh that, you could safely consume 18 milligrams of glyphosate a day in your diet, remain within that 100-fold margin of safety, remain underneath your ADI. So 18 milligrams, I guess, doesn't sound like a whole lot. So, so how easy is it to get 18 milligrams of glyphosate? Well, you get it really quick if you drank out of the bottle, but don't drink the glyphosate out of the bottle. What if you had vegetables, you had a very vegetable-rich diet that had a lot of this thing? Uh, so the paper was, was published, and this is linked in the notes section of the slide, where they looked at a number of different vegetables that were sprayed uh, or had, had uh, potentially been exposed to glyphosate. They're looking at residues that were found in different plants. And they created what's called a, a worst case dietary scenario. That if you ate only the vegetables that were had contaminants of glyphosate in the highest amounts that they could find on the market, um, the worst case scenario is that you would intake 0 0.6 milligrams per day which is way less than your 18 milligrams a day. And the, the danger in raising fear about trace amounts of things like glyphosate in vegetables that are available at the supermarket, the danger is that people will start avoiding vegetables altogether. And that a much, much, much bigger risk to your health is having a diet low in fruits and vegetables, right? So this residue, it's not even on the map in terms of its risk to you w compared to the risk of avoiding the vegetable altogether. All right, so despite all this science, we're seeing articles like this, Mercola.com, you may have seen a couple of times come up in the course. Monsanto's Roundup herbicide may be most important factor in development of autism and other chronic disease. So, What's, coming, what's this coming from? And this is, this is a very interesting story because if I read the article, you can see the study it linked and you can go back and back and back and back. And the story actually goes back to this paper published in 2013 in a very obscure journal called Entropy. And it's actually one I've never heard of outside of the context of this particular paper. So it was written primarily by a scientist named Dr. Stephanie Seneff. And when I say doctor, I do not mean medical doctor. She is a PhD in computer science. And what happened is she was a professor of computer science at MIT, very prestigious school in the US, 
for many years until she retired. And then when she retired, she kind of became a, a I don't know if crusader is the right word, but uh, became extremely interested in the effects of glyphosate and their potential effects on human health. Now, it's important to, to emphasize that she doesn't have education in any of the relevant sciences, like epidemiology or toxicology, or even an experimental science for that matter. She's a computer scientist. And notice this little note here that the authors um, put. They said, note added by publisher, the editors of this journal have been alerted to concerns over potential bias and opinions and bias in the choice of citation sources in the article. We note the authors stand by the content as published. Uh, since the natures uh, of the claims concern speculation opinion, not fraud or academic misconduct, they would like to express uh, issue and expression of concern. So this paper has been widely, widely criticized because it's not an experimental work. What, it was, what was done here is many different unrelated papers were sort of brought together and correlations were then drawn out from this particular work. And she was, because she was an academic all her career, she was able to write it in such a way that it seemed very convincing. She was able to obfuscate the, like, you know, like to kind of hide or muddy the water around what was actually being said and the evidence that was present for it. And this probably would never have been published in a high-end journal like Science or Nature. But if you go to her website, she has a lot of different, uh, maybe more easy to digest PowerPoint presentations and so on, where she discusses her views around this supposed link between disease, well, conditions like autism and, uh, and uh, glyphosate. And this is sort of her smoking gun, as she would call it. What she's plotting here is autism rates at age six in blue, starting in the early 90s, going to 2011 in this particular graph. And in red, um, this is the amount of glyph, no, I think, yeah, autism is in blue. Red is the amount of glyphosate use in the US over the same period. And glyphosate use went hugely up starting in the 90s once those Roundup Ready crops were developed. So they're both going up together at the same time, which we understand this to mean that this is a correlation, right? This does not mean that one caused the other. That's confusing causation with correlation. So this is something that we talked about very early on in the course to be very careful not to do. Just because two things are increasing with time uh, doesn't mean that they're connected. The other thing, which seems sort of obvious uh, to a lot of people today, with the data around autism rates going back into the 90s, is it wasn't very well recognized. And there, in fact, prior to the 90s, there weren't very clear diagnostic criteria. So there's very few, um, very few diagnoses made prior to the year 2000 because of this, because of the, the lack of, of standards in which you could base such a, uh, such a diagnosis. It's almost like I saw, it was like a, a meme and someone said, you know, autism didn't exist before 1990 because nobody diagnosed any cases. And then someone said, well, yeah, nobody saw Pluto before 1930, but I'm pretty sure it was there the whole time, right? So likely what we're seeing here in increased rates of autism is actually largely uh, an improvement in diagnostic criteria, which is allowing people to, to um, that's part of it. Another part of it is much, much better supports today that are provided for autistic individuals. And in order to access those supports, typically people need a diagnosis. So there's more of a drive to get that diagnosis done because that way you can access supports, which didn't exist in the 90s. So there wasn't really as much of a need to get that diagnosis. Also, as long as we are doing correlations, if you look at organic food sales over the same period of time and autism rates, they are also tightly correlated as well. Although I don't think anyone would suggest that it was the, the um, popularity of organic food is any way related to the amount of autism that we have. She goes a step further and 
what she does is she extrapolates off into the future where she was able to say, I think this was done in uh, 2011, looking at the rates of autism and how their increase uh, tracked up to 2011, the rates were about 1.5% of US children in 2011. And she was saying if they continue to increase as they are, which is this green line, then I think it was by 2030, 50% of all children born in the US would be autistic. And then by 2050, 100% would be autistic. So clearly she was extrapolating this data well beyond what was reasonable. So that paper is, is generally not to be believed, right? This is kind of what I'm getting at here. That uh, is a very, very non-scientific approach to the data. Uh, there was no causation established. It was all correlation. And many, many other things can also be correlated to autism rates, like cell phone use. Cell phone use was like non-existent in the 1990s. Cell phone use is almost ubiquitous today. That probably rose up in a similar type of pattern to autism rates and glyphosate spraying and, and anything that's new really, like total computer processor power in the world probably has gone up the same way. Anything that's, that's sort of more, more recent. Um, which of the following is not one of the positive attributes of Roundup? And the answer here is A. Weeds actually are developing resistance to Roundup. So, you know, Roundup has some good factors to it, but plants are developing that, that have evolved some resistance. Okay. Dr. Stephanie Seneff has incorrectly implicated Roundup glyphosate with what condition? And it was autism. IBS, that was, uh, that was the one that, uh, what's the guy's name? Wakefield, Dr. Andrew Wakefield connected with vaccines. Also incorrectly. Uh, last little bit, we just have a couple of minutes, but I, I think I can finish this. I got like five or six slides. Nicotine is another very potent insecticide and nicotine is produced by the plant, tobacco plant, to ward off pests. The fact that it is a, a stimulant for human beings is, you know, I guess good for the plant, I suppose, and the fact that it's now widely cultivated, but uh, Nicotine is actually a fairly potent insecticide and has been used since the 17th century uh, in, in extracts to spray as an insecticide for other crops as well. Nicotine is actually really toxic. It's in the highly hazardous section, which is about the top section uh, that we currently use today. It's allowed to be used in organic farming because of course it's a natural substance. It's produced from a natural plant, um, yet, this can be very, very toxic to human beings in amounts that you might find in a bottle of pesticide, for example. So what chemists have done is tried to find alternatives to nicotine, realizing that the structure of nicotine causes it to be quite toxic to in insects. <clears throat> and there's a class of, of, of pesticides that are called neonicotinoids. Neo means new, nicotinoids means like nicotine. So neonicotinoids, which are often uh, abbreviated as neonics, are synthetic pesticides. They have uh, structures that are reminiscent to nicotine. Like they have this ring here, for example, which we call a pyridine ring. Uh, and what, what they do is they take the structure of nicotine and tweak the structure and play with it to try to create properties that are uh, more desirable for us. And so one of those things is we want to produce, it, uh, produce a, a derivative that's much less toxic to people. Nicotine, the LD50, is three milligrams per kilogram in mice. This one, which is imidacloprid, is the number one neonicotinoid, is actually the number one insecticide produced worldwide. Um, it, has an LD50 way, way higher, meaning it's much less toxic, right? By a factor of 150 than plain old nicotine. So this is great. You'd want to program in designing a molecule like this, you want to design one with very, very low toxicity. Um, 
the same slide twice. Yeah. However, it's extremely toxic to insects. So for example, for dogs, the LD50 was 450 milligrams per kilogram body weight. For bees, it's 230 micrograms per kilogram of body weight. So that means doses of somewhere between five and 50 uh, nanograms of this neonicotinoid is enough to kill a single bee. Because bees, I spent time Googling how much bees weigh. They weigh about 300 milligrams each. So this is very deadly to insects, which makes it great as an insecticide. Problem is, is there's many insects which are beneficial, especially agricultural insects like bees for pollinating plants and other things like spiders for natural uh, predators of harmful, potentially harmful insects. So starting in the sort of mid 2000s, like 2005 or so, uh, what people started noticing was a dramatic increase in something called colony collapse disorder, which is a phenomenon where over the winter, bee colonies, basically the, 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 the bees all just die, and then they're of course not available in the spring. And this has always been a problem with beekeepers, and they always expected a certain number of their beehives and so on, but they noticed a big increase up to around 30%, 37%, nationwide. And certain farms were losing all of their bees, for example, or 90 plus percent, which became very concerning. And a huge amount of study since that time in the last 15 years has gone into the causes. And the finger was first pointed at these neonicotinoids as being potentially the reason why this was taking place. Um, there's a lot of conflicting scientific data on this. It's a very complex problem. There's a lot of different issues that are facing in these bees, not just neonicotinoids like this, but also uh, an infestation of a new kind of mite, and as well as different fungal diseases and so on that can be spread. Um, at the very least, what we can say, this is the David Suzuki Foundation asking that we ban neonicotinoids uh, so that we don't have, we don't continue to stress our bee population. I would say this, I, I would say neonicotinoids are not the sole cause of bee populations in distress, but it is probably, it's at least fair to say, it's probably a contributing factor. Great, so what, what do you think? Are pesticides safe? Well, it depends. Nothing is completely without consequences or without negatives or drawbacks. To me, it comes down to what is the application? Why are we using this insecticide? If it's to make your lawn greener, I don't see a big reason, I don't see that as a big benefit, and I probably, I would personally not choose to use pesticides in that situation. But if it's securing a food supply, that's quite a different thing. On a, on a, you know, on a civilization level, ensuring a food supply is of course important. On an individual level, if you're a farmer, ensuring that you can have crops to sell is also an important thing. So, it all comes down, there's, there's a lot of nuance in terms of what the pesticide is. Whether it's organic or not is, to me, beside the point. It's what's the chemical structure, what are its chemical characteristics, what's its toxicity, what's its environmental fate. All of these are sort of questions that you need to ask. And it's, it's a hugely complex issue, okay? And, and there's not easy answers, and it all depends. And, and the answer is going to be it depends, it depends, it depends. Great. One more question. What common insecticide has recently been associated with colony collapse disorder in honeybees? This one should be pretty straightforward. Neonix, neonicotinoids. Great. All right, just catching up on the comments there. Lots of great comments today, so that's good. This is it for us for this slide. I said there's about a dozen, I was close. We have 11 questions. We'll meet again on Friday. Please don't, no we won't, Thursday. Friday, we, we never have class on Friday, plus it's a holiday. But we will meet on Thursday. Please don't forget to get your uh, assignment two links submitted to me before the end of day on Thursday. Midnight is end of day. Wonderful. So I'm going to stop my stream here and goodbye everyone.